honor you to be introduced that way by such a good friend. But the problem when your friends introduce you is sometimes they just overemphasize whatever abilities you might have. And you know they've gone over the edge, as Bill just did, by wanting to know about what my vision for the state of New York is. <laughs> it's really very little, Bill. <laughs> I uh, am thrilled to be here to join all of you here at Abney. I remember my first Abney breakfast uh, 23 years ago in November of 1985, right after Mayor Koch's third election. And I have come here many times, listened to Mayor, many speakers, and like most people in public service, hope maybe one day I would get to speak to you. But I never thought when that day came, I would be governor. And so, But the, the circumstances uh, under which I've taken this office are troubling. Four weeks ago in a day, when what happened happened, my first thought was to call my father. And I told him what appeared to be transpiring, and he said to me, I think you need to say a prayer. And I told him that I had said a prayer for my dear friend, Elliot Spitzer, for his family for all of the turbulence that I know they are going through and would go through. And then my father said, well, actually, I meant that you need to say a prayer for yourself. <laughs> and I said that prayer, but in many ways, I am still struggling with it. Elliot Spitzer is a dear friend of mine. You last saw him on February 28th right here, uh, outlining the economic development plan for New York State. Uh, he's been a great public servant. I don't think the last chapter on Elliot Spitzer's contribution to our society is complete, and I think in the resilience that has always underscored his life, he will again uh, make great contributions to his neighbors in this society. But as is our government and our custom and our constitution, the time moves on, and we are weathering the storm that has beset us in Albany, all around New York City, and in the greater metropolitan area, and all around the state. That is one of two storms that has confronted our New York in the last few weeks. The first being a crisis in government, in the confidence of our government. Albany's uh, relationship with the public, already in many ways fractured and sensitive, has now created an even greater mistrust in government and also the crisis of our economy. We have a national economy reeling. The sub mortgage crisis has affected us in so many ways. Who knew that so many investment banks had plunged millions of dollars into the sub mortgage, uh, into the mortgage situation? Who knew, for instance, that the pension system, the teachers' pension system in Florida, would put 40% of their resources of investment into the subprime mortgage issue and now do not have the money to fund schools and teachers in that state. Um, obviously, New York is the commercial capital of our country. Wall Street's revenues generate 20% of our economy. Our economy obviously is more stagnated than any others. And yet, uh, taking all this, with uh, two weeks to go in our budget process, probably created the most difficult transition in New York State's history. But at a time when it was most needed, a new spirit of cooperation has been struck. And over the last three weeks, we have worked night and day. We have continued to try and address some of these issues. And I would say that with a little luck, we will pass New York City's budget, New York State's budget today. said this morning. <laughs> but the reality is that in passing this budget, we recognize that there are greater obstacles to overcome. 
When I was inaugurated just, two, just three weeks ago, I borrowed from the remarks of Robert F. Kennedy speaking at the uh, Democratic National Convention in 1964, one of only two times he publicly addressed the death of his brother. But then in speaking about society and the ability to affect change, uh, Robert F. Kennedy said that no matter how much talent an individual may have, no matter how much energy he may possess, no matter, no matter how much honesty or integrity he or she may avert, that if that person is alone and does not have the cooperation of others, they can accomplish very little. What we have seen in the past few weeks is the opportunity of individuals to work together, and I want to publicly thank the Speaker of the Assembly, Sheldon Silver, and the Majority Leader of the Senate, Joe Bruno, along with the other leaders, Jim Tedesco and Malcolm Smith, and all of my colleagues in government from the administrative end to the legislative end, to the support staff for the great work that they've done over the past few weeks. It is, we have passed a budget, but we have to take a realistic view of what that budget is. The budget that was presented to me was too big and too bloated. It had somewhere between a 4.8 to 5.1% growth in our state economy. It followed what was really the growth of personal income. Now, I am not going to be critical of the formulators of the budget in light of some of the national effects that have seeped down to the New York economy just in the past couple of months. But I maintain that those signals were in the air and we knew about them. The economic crisis, that dictated and delayed most of our activities last year, that took a vacation over the summer, but came back in a vengeance in the late fall, had been set on us by, the, by January. How much more foresighted would it have been to have addressed a budget growth based on the inflation rate, about 2 to 2.5%, rather than a rate that ballooned out a lot of our revenue forecast and our expenditures? Had we taken that other approach, even if we were wrong, we would have then returned a billion to a billion and a half dollars to a sagging economy in which we had in our budget for 2009-2010 a built-in 3.6% budget deficit. So even if we had misestimated, we would have addressed our problems down the road. But rather, we created a situation where by the time there was a transition in the administration in mid-March, we were now going down a, a road where the legislatures had set their priorities based on the budget forecast that we had already uh, acquired. Who can blame them? No one. But who can remind them? We can. Remind them of the terrible truth that governments have faced when they have misestimated revenues, when they have used one-shots to solve all their problems, when they have used debt to try to, uh, to refinance their accounts, and when they have come up with gimmicks to solve real problems. 